Now we are starting with the HTML basics. In this section, we go through a few basic HTML elements or tags. Then we will switch to CSS. As such, both CSS and HTML will go together. But still, there are few HTML concepts and elements we need to know before we start the CSS and HTML together. So let's begin with understanding the HTML page structure first. This is how a basic HTML page structure looks. You might have seen this or if you haven't, then don't worry. This is how it looks. This is how you define the HTML page structure or you can say it as a basic HTML page skeleton. Let's break it down tag by tag so you can know what each tag does. First, we have the doc type which tells the browser about the version of HTML. Currently, it says that we are using the HTML5, which is the latest version of the HTML. In fact, writing this doc type HTML means it is the HTML5 page. In the previous version, we had different syntax to define the versions. But nowadays, we don't worry about it. We simply write exclamation doc type and HTML and that does the job. Remember, this is not an actual HTML tag. It's more like a comment which just tells the browser about the version we are using of HTML. It is essential to write this on the top of every HTML page you make. Next is the HTML tag itself. Now by giving these tags, whatever you write or code between these tags means that it will be part of your HTML page. It's more like a container to all the other HTML tags. That means our entire page will fall under the HTML tag. Next is the head tag. The head tag generally contains the document related information that is metadata. Metadata is nothing but the collection of the data which describes the data. So the head tag is the data about the actual page. So it's not the page itself, but the information about the page. So we can include many special tags inside this head tag. We will see those as we move on. But at the moment, let's check this title tag. The title tag is used to define the title of the web page. So if I say here, for example, HTML page structure, and check the browser so you can see the title of the web page now it says html page structure so this is what title tag is used for the next tag is the body tag now the body tag is where you apply the actual content of the web page contents like text images comment box checkbox drop down list and whatnot you will be applying most of your html tags here in the body when you are designing your web page. So you get the idea about how the tags are defined. You can define tags inside other tags, which you can see here that the title is defined inside head and all these tags are defined inside the HTML tag. To understand this more clearly, take a look at this tree structure of the HTML. Now, if you add an H1 inside body, the tree structure will be updated like this. And if I add another H1 tag, they both will be on the same level of this tree. So this was the detailed information about the HTML structure and how you can define it. As a developer, writing all these tags in the first place can be very time consuming. So if you are using the VS code, that is a shortcut for getting the HTML boilerplate code. Let me show you. I'll remove all these tags. So we have blank screen now. Now if I press exclamation and enter, you can see that now we have the whole HTML structure defined by pressing one single key. Let's talk about relative questions. So the relative question is why do we need to specify doc type HTML at the beginning of the page? So as I have mentioned earlier that doc type HTML is used to specify the version of the HTML to your browser. Currently, HTML5 is the latest version available and that we are using here. 
So it's essential to define the version of your HTML to your browser when defining the code. In this lecture, I am discussing about the paragraph tag. This tag is mainly used to write text messages which can be in paragraph format or even in a single line format. It not only takes text messages but also allows you to wrap an image URL or maybe any other URL inside the paragraph tag. But there is a proper way to do that which we will see as we move along. Let me show you a simple example here. Inside body, I will give the paragraph and you can see when I give the paragraph tag, it closes the paragraph tag as well. So it is mandatory to define the end of paragraph. Now let me define some sample text. I'm just pasting some text here and let's check the browser. So the paragraph is being displayed inside this HTML document. Now, by default, the paragraph tag has its own set of attributes on how it's going to look in the document, unless the programmer wants to change them with their choices of attributes. I will show you what I mean. If I give another paragraph here, which is right next to the end of first paragraph, and I'm not separating these texts to the new line, I'll keep the paragraph in single line, right? Now if we check the browser, you can see that the paragraph is by default divided in different lines. So this is what paragraph tag does or rather this is how the functionality of paragraph tag is. So even if I press enter here and also if add some white spaces in between, you can see that it says the same. So if you give extra spaces or extra lines inside paragraph tag, the browser counts those extra spaces and lines as a single one. So it will get removed and the paragraph stays as it is. That means it's meaningless to give extra white spaces or extra lines to the text while using the paragraph tag. Notice that it also adds a single blank line before the new paragraph begins. Hence, dividing the two paragraphs. So this is how you can work with the paragraph tag and often we see putting paragraph is a very common practice in any web page you observe. Now let's talk about relative questions. So the first question is, what is the purpose of giving paragraph tag inside HTML document? Well, the paragraph tag is used to define a paragraph inside HTML document and also it is mandatory to define the paragraph between these two tags that is it should have the start and the end of the tag. There are few tags where you do not need the end of the tag which I will discuss in the forthcoming sections as those tags are called as empty tags. The second question is what will happen if you try to give white spaces and extra lines inside the paragraph tag. If you try to give extra spaces, that is white spaces and extra lines to the paragraph while in p tag, then those spaces and lines will get removed by the web browser while displaying that paragraph as the p tag is tend to perform that way. So it's meaningless to give white spaces and extra lines inside a single paragraph tag. In this lecture, I will be discussing about tag, empty tag and element. Let's begin with tag. A tag is an HTML language keyword or command which gives instructions to the browser page. For example, we have seen the paragraph that is the p tag which instructs the browser to make a paragraph on the web page. There are various tags available in HTML which are used to define the content of the web page. For example, inside body, you can see I have defined paragraph an H1 and I have wrapped them inside the div. So what are those? All these are known as tags. So this P is a tag. H1 is a tag, 
and div is also a tag. In HTML, a tag contains three main parts, opening the tag, content inside the tag, and finally closing the tag. Now looking at this structure, tags can be content for other tags too. So this paragraph and h1 works as contents inside the div tag. Let's define the content inside paragraph and h1. I will say here lorem and press enter so you can see the dummy text gets written here. In HTML5, that is the latest version of HTML and inside the VS code which I am using right now, it provides a functionality to give dummy text just by writing the lorem keyword. Anyway, in the h1 I will write a message saying hello. As you can see in the browser the paragraph and the message is displayed. Every HTML tag is also called as an element. Now there are also some tags which do not have content. So for example, let me put an HR tag here. HR stands for horizontal rule which creates a horizontal line on the page. Let's check the output. So you can see the horizontal line created by the HR tag which divides the paragraph and h1. The standard practice is that when we don't have a closing tag, we use tag with a slash inside the angle bracket itself like this one. This is called as self-closing. So here as such there is no error but still you should close this hr tag this way. Let us look at one more empty tag known as br that is the break tag or new line. So let's say I want to give new line after this sentence. So I will give br here and let me add few more break tags inside these paragraphs. Let's check the output now. So you can see that we have now added some new lines by giving the br that is the break tag. So the tag in which we do not have content and doesn't need an end or closing tag is called as an empty tag. Because there is no content it is the empty tag. Other tags which do not need closing tags are meta, link, img that is the image tag. So this is what a tag and element is in HTML. Now let's talk about relative questions. So the first question is what is a tag in HTML and is it necessary to close all the tags when used? Well a tag is an HTML language keyword or command which gives instructions to the browser and it is necessary to close the tag as long as that tag contains the content defined in it but when it comes to empty tags they do not have the closing tag and that's the second question what is an empty tag a tag which does not have any content in between so you can say that it is empty content and that's why they are called as empty tags also when we do not have the closing tag we try to self close these tags with the syntax like hr and br we have already seen in the example. Now let's talk about attributes in html. So the attributes are special words which can be used to define additional information to the elements or tags. Generally they are used to define the behavior of the elements. Let me show you an example of attribute named style. For example, I want to color the text of this paragraph. So here in the paragraph I will put a space and will say style equals to and I will open the double quotes so you can see the various styling options it shows. Now I will say color colon red. Let's save this and let's check the output. So you can see that the paragraph is in the red color. You can also add color to this hr here as well. So let's do that again. I will say style here and color property and giving the color. So now the color of this hr is changed. 
you can add many properties to a single element with the help of style attribute. We will be having a dedicated lecture about style attribute in the forthcoming section. Right now our focus is to understand the term attribute. The other few important attributes which are used widely are ID, class, href, src, etc. We will be going through all these attributes as we move ahead with the tutorial. You can also have multiple attributes applied on a single element. Like earlier we have just seen that there is a paragraph and the color is applied with a style attribute. So style is the single attribute. But let me first of all show you the syntax. You have the tag name, then the attribute equals to value. Then you have a space to have a separation between two or more attributes. So space is the separator. So space again attribute is equal to value and so on. Let's practically see one. Here in this paragraph, I'm just going to say style is equal to color red. And now I'm going to give ID is equal to para that is paragraph. So this is just an ID of this paragraph. Of course, this ID will not be of any use at the moment, but you can get the idea. This is how you can apply multiple attributes to a single element. Let's talk about relative questions. So the first question is what are attributes and how can you define them? Attributes basically change the behavior of the element. Whenever you want to modify the characteristics of the element, you can use attributes. The second question is how can you apply multiple attributes to a single element? So here is the syntax. You have the tag name, you have the attribute, you keep on writing the attribute, each attribute separated by a space and the values are always covered in double quotes to make sure you follow these standards and this is how you can apply the multiple attributes. In this lecture I will be discussing about two most important tags that is the div tag and the span tag. The div tag is used to define a division that creates a section in an HTML document. So if you want to put contents like navigation bar, images, text and much more, you can insert them inside division with ease. As we move ahead with some practical designs, you will understand the importance of the div tag. Also it works as a container for different HTML elements. Let's look at the syntax of div tag. So looking at this example, I have defined two divisions here in this format. Now let's take a look at the browser and let me press the inspect here. So you can see the code which we have defined is displayed here. Now if I roll over the mouse to the first div, you can see it focuses on the area which that div covers. So you can see the second div is inside the first div. Now if I roll over the mouse on second div, you can see it focuses on the area covered by that division. This is what div tag does. It creates a division or a section in the web document and then you can use that division as a container for other elements as well. Let's talk about the span tag now. The span tag is much like division but span is used to deal with the part of a text. For example, let's say I want to color this text CSS only. So I'm just going to put a span around the CSS. I'll say span style is equal to color colon red and I'm going to end the span here. Now if you look at the output, you can see that the word CSS is now in red color. Now the important question here is then what is the difference between div and span? And to understand this, let me just change this span to div and let's see the output. As you can see, div has entered a new line that is a block with new line. So div is called as block element whereas span is an inline element. And the reason is when you want to format just few words and you do not want it to disturb, then 
you use the span tag because span does not insert any extra space or extra line nothing it just is there silently performing the operation i hope this gives you clear idea about div and span certainly we are going to use it often in the forthcoming sections with practical designs so this will be more clear with practical implementations now let's talk about relative questions so the question is what is the difference between div and span so as i mentioned div is a block line element that means it is going to create a block and going to enter a new line whereas the span tag doesn't add any line any white space it is just there and if you want to style or you want to apply some formatting to words then span is the tag which you would be using in this lecture i will be talking about the html heading tags heading tags are generally used to define heading inside the web page there are six different heading tags available which are used to define headings inside html document that is h1 h2 to h6 so we have h1 2 3 4 5 and 6 when it comes to giving a heading inside HTML document, each of them has their own different purpose. Consider this example here. I have defined the heading tags here with a message to be displayed as heading on the web page. Let's take a look at the output. As you can see, the difference between all these headings is quite visible. The h1 tag is used to define the most important heading in the HTML document and it also has the size much greater than the rest of the headings as well. Generally we see that h1 is used only for the main title so we don't see h1 repetitively used in a web page. h2 is used to give the second most important heading inside the HTML document h3 to h5 heading tags are generally used to define any subtopics or less important things inside the html document and if you want a text or even a sentence to be highlighted h6 tag is useful in that case but mainly you see that the heading tags are used for giving headings only the heading tags can also be used with nested elements like here in the code i have nested the h2 and h3 tags inside the div tag as we move ahead with more practical examples we will see h1 to h6 tags are used often at various places the one relative question one can think of is that in which case you will use h1 or maybe h2 or h6 so I've already mentioned that when it comes to highlighting a topic, H1 gives the biggest size for the font. You also have other ways to highlight text, but H1 is one of the tag which is provided by HTML, which you can directly use to give a main title. As long as H2 or H3 tags are concerned, looking at the output, you can make out at what place you will need in your web page design. Now we are going to understand the unordered list tag in HTML. In HTML, list tags are used to display the information in the form of lists. The unordered and ordered list tags are used when you want to display a list of information in HTML document. These are the two most used list tags in HTML. Let's start with ul tag this tag is also called as an unordered list tag as the name says this tag is used to display the items which are not in orderly format that is displaying just the random list of information with bullets so for example here in the code let's say i want to define the unordered list i will say the ul tag and this will define the unordered list inside your HTML document. Now to define the items inside the tag, we use the li tag. 
which represents the list item inside the tag. You cannot write the items without giving the li tag inside the list. So let me define few list items. Li's should always be written inside their parent element that is in this case the ul tag. So now let me say li here. The first is the paragraph tag. Let me copy and paste this multiple times and let me change the text. Span and div tag, attributes, anchor tag, empty tags and elements. That's it. Now let me just save this. And here you see. So this is how the list items are displayed with the ul tag. Now by default the items are displayed in bulleted format but you can change the bullet types as well. You just need to write type attribute after the ul tag. Let's say I want to display the items with circular disk bullets. For that I will say type equal to circle. Let me just save. And now you see that bullet type is changed. The type attribute allows four bullet types which are disk, circle, square and none. Let's check them practically. I'll say disk as a type instead of circle. Looking at the output you can say that the disk type is the default bullet which will be displayed when type attribute is not specified. Now let's see the square attribute type. I'll give square here. And now you see in the output that we have the square bullet displayed with each list item. And lastly the none as bullet type. And now you see that there is no bullet given to any of the list item. So that's pretty much the unordered list tag offers. Now let's talk about a relative question. The question is how will you change the bullets in an unordered list? So as discussed we have the type attribute and we have four types of values here. The disk, the circle, the square and none and which we have seen practically. So this is how you change the bullet type. Now let's talk about the ordered list tag. That is the OL tag. The OL tag is used to display the list items in orderly format that is in numbered format. It follows the same syntax like seen in ul tag. The only difference is that you have to define the ol that is ordered list instead of ul that is unordered list. So let's change this here and let's check the output. So you can see the items are displayed in the numeric format. Just like ul we can change the type of numerical order. By default the order will start with 1 but if I want to change the numeric format to let's say Roman numerals I can do that by saying type is equal to uppercase I. Let's do this and save and you can see the order is displayed in Roman numerals. The OL allows us 5 different ordered formats which are 1 lowercase i, uppercase i, uppercase a and lowercase a. Let's check them practically. I will give lowercase i first and let's go back to the output and you see that it's a Roman numerals but they are in the lowercase. If you want to display the list in alphabetical order then you can say uppercase a. So let's do that here and we save it. Let's check the output. So you see that now the ordered is with A, B, C, D and so on. And to display the list in lowercase alphabetical order, you simply use the lowercase a instead of this uppercase a. Let's save this and again check the output. So you have the list here with the lowercase alphabets. We can also display the items starting from a certain numeric or alphabetical value as well. You have seen that it is starting with 1 or A only 
but that can also be changed. So if I change the type here and let's say I want this order to be displayed from sixth place for this type, I will say start attribute and will give six here. Let's save. So you can see that the list started from the sixth position. Not only that, you can also display this numeric alphabetical values in reverse order. For that, I will simply give reversed attribute here. And let's check the output. And you can see the numeric values are now in reverse order. Remember, it won't change the content in reverse order, but it will just change the numeric or alphabetical values for the OL tag. You can also create a nested list using the list tag. Consider this example here where we have the UL as the main container in which there is an LI and further it has the OL that is order list and there are multiple list items and order lists inside the main UL container. Let's check the output. So this is how you can work with the HTML list tags. Let's talk about relative questions. The first question is explain the difference between ordered and unordered list. So it is the OL and UL tag. OL gives numbers to every list item whereas unordered list will show items with bullets only. The second question is how will you display the ordered list in reverse order? It is this reversed attribute as we have seen in this example which reverses the number or the alphabetical sequence. Let me also remind you that it doesn't change the content, it is just the number, it is just the numeric or alphabetical arrangement which is changed. The list item which you have given remains as it is. And the last question is, is it possible to set the starting number in an ordered list? Well, yes, certainly. Not necessary. By default, it starts with 1 or maybe A. But if you want to start it with, let's say, five or maybe six like we have seen in this example, you can certainly do that by using the start attribute. This lecture is about the anchor tag. So an anchor tag is used to define a hyperlink which links from one page to another. Let me show you what I mean. I will open Google and let's say I want to search learn maths. So all these items which you can see are actually hyperlinks. Let me inspect them so you can understand it much better. You can see when I roll over the mouse on the link, it displays A which is an anchor tag. Here also it shows anchor tag when I roll over the mouse. Even the menu items here like all, images, news, are all hyperlinks. So if you want to give hyperlink in your HTML document which connects other web pages, the anchor tag is used. This is the syntax of the anchor tag. We define the link by giving a that is the anchor then the href attribute to define the link path address or URL whatever you call it of any web page, a file which you want to open on, click off that link. href stands for hypertext reference which takes the address, path or URL of a web page or a file which is displayed as a link in the HTML document. Let's see an example. I will give anchor tag here and in the href, I will give a link of an HTML page which contains the message. So this is the file, back to index.html, we'll give the file name here in the href. Let me give the link name as well. All right, that's it. This is how you can define a link. Let's check the browser. You can see the link is being displayed. Now if I click it, you can see it redirects to the message page. Right now it redirects the display file on the same window 
but what if you want to display the message or give a link which opens in the new window for that there is an attribute called target which is used with the href attribute inside the anchor tag the target attribute specifies where to open the linked document so let me give target here and i will say underscore blank this will open the link in the new window now if i click on the link you can see it opens a new window to display the message you can use the anchor tag in many ways like here i have nested the anchor tag within the paragraph tag you can use anchor tag to link an image an audio file or even a video file as long as the path is valid anchor tag is the most important tag when it comes to implementing menus all the menu items are defined inside list items and each list item wraps an anchor tag as we proceed further with real world designs you will see anchor tag as a key tag anyway now let's talk about few relative questions so the first question is explain the practical purpose of anchor tag as i mentioned anchor tag is the tag which helps you to create menu items or menus on your web page and it's going to be used extensively for user interface or user interaction through menu items the second question is how can you view the link in the new window well as we already discussed the target is the attribute if you specify with the blank value it's going to open the link in a new window we have learned about the anchor tags but there is an advanced concept which is worth knowing so the majority of internal and external domain linking is achieved by using the html anchor tag in anchor tag there is an href attribute which is used to state the link's destination well the very use of the links are that they take you somewhere inside the web browser normally we see various types of links given to the href but do you know why these links begin with hash or only has hash as a link reference basically the hash in the href refers to the unique html element id to which the window that is the browser should be scrolled for example if you define an element like this where i give the division with id show and inside i define a paragraph i'll define the anchor tag giving href as hash show that is the id of this division so when i click on the link it will target the id which has been given inside the href as you can see here it refers to the id of the element so basically the hash in the href will target the element id available in the current page now what if you give only the hash inside href the href hash doesn't specify any id name but it does have a corresponding location on the page which is basically the top of the page so i'll make few changes here i'll bring the anchor tag below this division and also let me apply css to bring the link at the bottom of the page i'll just give margin to the div let's check the browser i'll scroll down to the bottom and you can see the link here let me click this and you can see it brings the page to top again so when there is no id to the target it goes nowhere that means it is going to go on top it will scroll to the top of the page and that generates one more relative question that is how will you create a link which scrolls to the top of the current page so now you already know how to do that i'll create a link first then i'll give a division and inside division i give heading for example and in css i'll add margin to this division so that the link goes to the bottom of the page that's one way to do it there are various other ways you can perform for achieving the same task 
Now in the browser, you can see the heading. I'll scroll down to the bottom of the page and we'll click the link and you see that it comes back to the top. In this lecture, I am discussing about the image that is the IMG tag. In HTML, image tag is used to display the image on a web page. Let's take a look at an example and the syntax. So if you are using IDEs like VS Code or Sublime, you can declare the image tag by simply writing the letters like, I'll say IMG and we'll press enter. You can see the image tag is declared with attributes SRC, which is the source or you can say the path or URL of the image. It basically tells the browser where it can find the image on the server. Let's try to give an image here. I will write image name. Right now this image is stored in the very same folder where the index.html is. Do note that images are not inserted into the web pages. They are more like links to the web pages. Let's save this and check the browser. And you can see the image is getting displayed. The second attribute is the alt that is ALT. Now this is used to define alternate text for an image. So it basically describes the text in case the image is not rendered. I will show you how. Let me give an alternate name to this image here. I'll say meeting. Now suppose the image is not getting rendered in any case, then the text given with alt attribute is displayed. For example, let me make this file unavailable by renaming it. Now let me just refresh. So when the web page cannot find the image, this text is displayed. You can see the alternate text which we have given is displayed while the browser cannot find the image on the server. So this is what alternate attribute does. It is considered to be a very helpful from search engine optimization perspective. Now you do not store images in the same folder where your HTML files are. Certainly you will have different folders like assets or maybe images where you keep your images. Let me just give you an example here. Right now this image file is inside C colon slash HTML basics slash IMG folder. So this is what I'm specifying here. And this way is also called as absolute path, which is not recommended, but I will explain what is absolute and what is the other way that is the relative path. But at the moment, let me give this path and let's save this and let's refresh. And you see that the image is getting displayed. Remember giving the absolute path is not a good practice as generally we use the relative path, which I'm discussing in the next lecture. There are two more attributes which are used with image tag and those are width and height. So let's go ahead and define those two attributes as well. I'll say width is equal to 800 and height is equal to 500. Now these attributes are not used lately, rather applying CSS to resize the image is more effective way. But let's see what is the output. Let's just refresh and you can see that the image is resized. Now what if you want to make an image clickable or provide a link to the image? You already have seen the anchor tag and that comes in help. So you just have to put this image tag inside the anchor tag. That's it. Let's do that. Here I'll say anchor href. I'll open a test.html when the user clicks on the image tag. Let me end the anchor tag here. Let's save this and go to the browser and let's refresh. And now you see that the image is clickable. The mouse pointer changes and I'm allowed to click. Let's do that. And this opens the test HTML, which shows the message. Hello. So this is how you can work with the IMG that is image tag. 
It's very simple and easy to use. The question here is, what is the purpose of the alt, that is the alternate text attribute? So we have the alt attribute. The important point here I want to discuss or I want to emphasize is that when your web page is configured with the search engines, that is SEO, in those cases, when the images have the alt attribute, then it really helps it improves the performance while the pages are optimized for search engines. Now I am discussing the difference between relative path and absolute path. When it comes to linking files inside the HTML document, a confusion may arise when giving a path which can be relative path or absolute path. Let us see an example. So you can understand the difference between relative and absolute path. So I have already defined the basic HTML code with the IMG tag here. Now I want to display these images inside my HTML document. Currently the images are in the assets folder and both the index.html file and assets folder are in the development folder as you can see. I'm assuming that this development folder is in a way your development server and you are developing the project on the development server, which we will later push to production and see what happens when you give the absolute path. So I will try to display the images using the absolute path. The absolute path is nothing but the full URL to the file. So what I will do is I will go to the assets folder and will copy the path from above. This path links with the web page and tells them where it can find the images. Now I will paste the path here in the SRC and will give the image name. So this is what an absolute path looks like. Like right now we have C colon slash whatever. You may have www dot the site name slash the rest of the path. So basically that's what the absolute path is. Remember it's very crucial that you give the correct path every time otherwise image won't get displayed on the web page. Now let's check the output and you see that image is displayed. Let's try to display other images as well. Now if you are using the VS code then you can directly copy the path of an image like this. So this will copy the absolute path of the image. I will paste it here. And now you can see the images are getting displayed. So we have used the absolute path so far. Now assume that the code is shifted to production server. And to create that scenario, I will move the files to production folder, which will actually change the path for all the images because I'm shifting the index and the assets folder as well. Now when I open this web page, you can see the images are gone. For obvious reasons, the paths are now changed for every image. So once again, I will have to change this absolute path. So we'll copy the path from the production folder like this and we'll change the path. All right, now when I refresh the page, you can see the images are getting displayed once again. So this is what working with absolute path looks like. When you give the absolute path, that means the path to the file is fixed. So if by any chance the images or files are shifted, there will be an issue accessing those files. So giving the absolute path is not an ideal way to display or access any file. On the other hand, giving the relative path can solve this kind of problems. Let's go back to the development folder and apply the relative path. I will start by giving a dot and a forward slash where the dot refers to the current folder. Now, if this is in the development, then dot refers to development. If it is in the production folder, then the dot refers to the production folder. So dot means the current folder. Double dot means the parent folder. These are the basics and I expect that you know uh, dot and double dot. So at the beginning of the path, 
I will put a dot here and a slash and that shows me the assets folder. I will select the image and will do the same for the rest of the paths. So this is what relative path looks like. Let me just save this. Let's check the output and you see that now for the development folder, this relative path is working fine. Now the real test is what if I again shift this index and the assets folder to the production folder. Let's try that. And now let's check the output and without any changes, this thing is working absolutely fine. So this is the advantage of using the relative path and relative paths are URL independent as it refers to the current folder regardless of where the files are. There is a relative question here that explain the difference between relative and absolute path and that's what we have seen that you give the dot that is the current folder and the rest of the path remains same. So regardless of where you put your files, it's going to refer the current folder. Browser will not have any issue accessing those files when the path is changed. Let's discuss about the HTML input tag now. The input tag is used to create input fields inside an HTML document which allows users to input the data. Mainly the input tag is used to create a form with various fields of input like text box, checkbox, radio button, email, numeric, etc. Let's understand it with an example. So let's first try to create a field for entering text values. So for that I will give here an input tag and you can see when I press enter it gets defined with the attribute type. This type equal to text means you are allowed to type alphanumeric values or any other characters for that matter. Let me just add some text like first name so user understands that this is where one has to enter the first name. Normally we use a label tag which we will see when we develop more advanced forms. Also the input tag is a self closing tag so you don't need to write the end input like this but you need to end the tag with a slash inside the input itself like this that is self closing. Now let's check the output. You can see we have created a field for entering the name. Now for all the input whose type is text, it's a good practice to assign them with an additional attribute called placeholder. I will show you how it can be useful. I'll simply add the attribute placeholder and will display a message saying enter your first name. Now when I open the browser, you can see that inside the text box, there is a gray colored message getting displayed which is a message for the end user one can easily understand what will be the value one can enter. This is what a placeholder is. The moment I click on the text box and try to enter any character you can see the message gets disappeared. So it's a good practice to give a placeholder message for users clarity. Let me show you few more fields we can try using input. I will add another text field saying last name. I will give two break tags here and let's say I want to give an age field. Now for the input type I won't be using the text. Instead I will give the number as input type. I will explain what this does when we switch to the output. I will also give the placeholder here. Let me also add break tags here as well. Saving this and let's check the browser. Now when I roll over the mouse to the age field, you can see it's giving me the option also called as spinners to change the age. So type equal to number will force the user to enter numeric values only. The type number has the built-in validation to reject non-numeric values. You can also set limit to the number type by just giving the min and max attribute. Like here, let me set the minimum value to 15. Now when I try to select the age, the age will start from 15 itself as you can see. So this is what type equal to number is used for. 
let's add a field for email now i will say email and then i'll say input type equal to email and a placeholder also so this will allow us to create a field specifically for email let's check the output there we have the email field now if i try to give an incomplete email address it will show me an alert message when i roll over the mouse on the field if i write email like this it will still show me an alert message saying the part after the at sign is missing so when we give input type email the input value is validated or checked automatically for the proper email format so this is how you can use input tag we will see how you can add check boxes and radio buttons in the next lecture now let's talk about relative questions so the question is how can you create an input where only the valid email is allowed well you have various ways to validate the email while you are doing javascript programming you have the regular expression to implement that but in a very simple manner using html if you want to implement the validation certainly with input you give type equal to email and that will do the job the second question is what is the purpose of placeholder attribute the placeholder attribute basically gives a message inside the input field that is a text box and the moment you start typing some value that automatically vanishes it's a good way to show user friendly messages for entering the values now let's move further with the input tag we will see two more input types that is checkbox and radio button so i will be using the same code i'll say coding languages here and the input type will be checkbox so this will create a checkbox inside your html document let me give few more checkboxes checkbox basically allows users to select the true or false option let me refresh the page and you can see that all these checkboxes remain unchecked but what if i want certain checkboxes to stay selected when the page is loaded that is in the beginning i want that the checkbox should be selected so for that there is an attribute called checked which will keep the checkbox selected whenever the page gets loaded in the browser that is selected by default initially let me give checked attribute to few fields now when i refresh the page you can see that the checkboxes with the checked attributes are already selected now let's see radio buttons defining radio buttons means you just have to say type equal to radio here i'm going to define a field gender and for that i'm using two radios so i'll say input type equal to radio male and again one more input type and here i'll just type female as text so you can see now there are two radio buttons and if i click on male or female you can see that they both are getting selected whereas with radio button interface only one option should be selected at a time and the other should get deselected automatically to set only one radio button selected out of multiple radios you have to set the name attribute to the same value this is also known as radio group which means each of the radio button in the group must be given the same name let's check this practically here let me give the name attribute inside these radio buttons and i'm going to give gender to both the radio buttons so this becomes a group when i give same name to multiple radio buttons let's save this and check the output so now if i select you see that the other is getting deselected automatically let's add two more radio buttons i'll copy these two and paste it again now they have the same name i want married and unmarried with these two radio buttons let's save this and check what is the output you can see that if i click on male female married or unmarried only one option is selected out of these 
four options. Now this is something not we want. We want that only male or female should be selected and married and unmarried is a different option. So in that case I will have a second group called M status. So let me change these two married and unmarried to the very same group but not the gender. Let's save this and now you see that male and female married or unmarried the selection is going the way we want. So this is the basic idea about checkbox and radio button. We will use a lot when we create forms in the forthcoming advanced sections. Now let's talk about relative questions. So how can you define a checkbox whose value remains selected on the page load? So by using the attribute checked you can achieve this as we have seen here in this example. The second question is what is radio grouping? So radio group is basically giving the same name to multiple options and if you give the same name that means out of those radios the user is allowed to select only one the rest of the radio from the same group will be automatically deselected. In this lecture I am discussing HTML select tag. The select tag is used to create a drop down list with various options inside the HTML document. Let's see an example and discuss the syntax. Let's say I want to create a drop down list for coding languages. So I will define the text first, suggesting what this drop down is about. And then I will define select tag and between these two tags the list options are given by using the option tag. So if I give here our first option saying HTML, this will be displayed as the first item inside the list. Let's add few more items to the list. I'll say JavaScript, React, Node.js, Java and PHP. So you can see the list is displayed. Now if you want to further nest the list items showing which languages are front-end and back-end, you can do that by giving the option group which creates separate groups of options inside the drop-down. So I will say OPT group that is option group and I will label it with front-end so this is going to be a group, a kind of category inside the same drop down. Similarly, I'll display backend here. And now let's check the output. So you can see that we have divided the list options in groups. There are also few attributes which can be used when required. Now let's check the size attribute. By default, the interface is drop down but let's say you want to show list items in a scrollable box like this. Then you can use the size attribute. When you don't want the drop down and want to show a box with the list, you decide the number of rows displayed at a time. Let's give size attribute to 3 and check the output. Now you can see that the interface has changed. There is no drop down but instead it is showing a list of items in a clickable box with scroll bars. And because we have given the size 3, there are only 3 rows displayed at a time, rest of the items are in the scrollable section. The next attribute is disabled which allows you to disable an option. So if I disable this option for example HTML and let's see the output. You can see I cannot select this HTML option as it is disabled. The select tag is very commonly used interface when it comes to showing dynamic data list items. Now let's talk about relative questions. So the first question is what does the select tag do? So as discussed it displays the drop down or even the list with the box. Not necessary always you need a drop down. Drop down basically saves the space on the screen but sometimes let's say you want to show the list of items straight away on the screen 
inside a box you can use the same select tag but with a size attribute the second question is how to create a group inside the select tag list so for creating a group we use the opt group that is option group tag like we have done here in this example and that creates group for the items now there is a practical question that write a program to display a list of items with the following interface and make html and java options disabled all right so looking at the interface you can tell it's not a drop down but it's a scrollable box so we will have to use the size attribute and let's say we want to show five items so we'll say size is equal to five and to disable the html and java options i'll say disable attribute here with this option and here as well with java and now let's check the output so you get the desired result in this video i'm going to discuss the most practical way of difference between html and xhtml to understand the concept i have prepared one html which is not xhtml and we are going to convert this html into xhtml so you get the idea about how the html and xhtml differs though the code which i have written right now is also not html it is a very bad bad way of writing the html but i just want to prove that xhtml is a strict and a better way of writing html right now the page which you see starts with straight away the html it has the body it does have a paragraph but as you see that the h1 doesn't have any end of it the next thing is the h2 which i have placed here is not in small case it is in upper case the h is in upper case also with h3 i have written the style but you see that the style is also in upper case and the color which i do not put in any kind of quotes be it double quotes or single quotes so this is not the right way or you can say that you do not see this kind of html generally but the best part of html is which is in a way worse part there is no error coming anywhere if i just run the particular page you will see the output as it is desired let me just open the browser and you see that this is how it looks so now you see that we have this paragraph the header which doesn't have any end but because somehow it found the structure and it continued with header 2 the br tag is also there which adds a line and then we have the h3 so what my point here is that html does not give any error but at the same time as a developer people or the developers community follow some rules to write the html to make it standard and that strict way that standard way is called as xhtml so let's say if i want to convert this page into xhtml the very first thing i'll take care of is that i'll write the doc type now the next thing is you always should have an end of every tag so this h1 should always have an end tag that's a right structure in fact even in html let's say there is some structure which is getting disturbed even in html the output may not be as desired but it will not give error even in xhtml it's not that once you follow the xhtml rules it is going to give you any error it doesn't give any error it is a kind of standard which programmers follow to write the code right because it's always good to follow some standards many programmers are working on the same code or even you yourself when you open your program after few days you may not get the idea what is written and what is written where so you generally follow standards and rules so that the code is easy to debug or the code is easy to maintain and that's what xhtml does you have to follow those rules then it is called as xhtml though there are sites which give you that it is xhtml standard followed or not kind of validation now i have the end tag of this h1 so now i can say that i'm following xhtml at least for this one for this line when i say that i want to follow xhtml i will convert the capital letter into small that is upper case tags are not something which you put when you write or when you follow the xhtml standard now you have observed that even h was capital earlier it was not giving error 
but it's just that I'm following the rule of XHTML that I will not use upper cases while there are HTML or CSS related tags or rules. Here also the same thing I will do. Attributes should also be in lower case, right? Then the attribute values should always be in double quotes. This is also another XHTML rule. Earlier, this all was working fine. There was no issue. So don't judge that XHTML is something which will make sure that there will be an error if rules are not followed. There is no error. You saw in the beginning that without these things also it was working fine. It's just that as a developer, you take it seriously that you follow standard while writing the code. The same way, what another thing can be done is, see this H3 tag has some content in between. So when there is a content in between, I'm going to have an end of the tag. But what about this BR, the break tag? It doesn't have any content in between. That means it is an empty tag. Even if you have an empty tag, that should also have an end. How do you end that? I will just self close it or self end it. This is how I'm going to end even the empty tag. Let's say in case if you have an input tag, for example, I write input type is equal to let's say text. See this attribute is in lowercase and attribute value is in double quotes. Now this does not have any content in between. So it's a kind of empty tag. I'm going to end it like this. So this is another XHTML rule which I am following here. So like BR, you also have another HR which is an empty tag. So that should also have an end like this. As I mentioned, if you don't write like this, let's say I don't write this ending slash. Is it going to give me error or will it not work? No, the HR will certainly display the horizontal rule. That is the line. But the thing is, because you are following the standard, you will follow all XHTML rules. And that is the difference between XHTML and HTML. Let me list out the differences once again with the code sample so you get the idea. So here it is. Up till now, we have seen a lot of HTML tags and learned their concepts. Now in this lecture, I am discussing about one more important concept that is semantic tags. This concept is introduced in the newer version of HTML that is the HTML5. So before we start understanding what semantic tags are, let me show an example. Suppose we have an address to display like this. Now this address is placed inside a division. Certainly it is going to display the address. There is no issue at all. Now if I want to use the semantic tag concept, what I will do instead of this division, I will put the address tag. Let's check the output. So you see the address is displayed and also the font style is changed to italic. But that is not our purpose. That is not something which we want to observe. The point which I want to make is that looking at this code, a developer or a person who is not familiar with HTML can easily make out that this content which we have should be an address, which by reading the div tag, one cannot make out. Well, it's not about whether it is readable to the developer or not. But the important point is your site should have the accessibility, which means that people with, let's say, visual challenges should also be able to refer to your site. Now, how does this happen? It actually happens by using the screen reader softwares. These softwares help people listen to the content of the site. So when the screen reader software tries to speak the content of the site for visually challenged people. For example, if it reads this code, then it will be div, then the address and the div ends. But with this code, you see that the address is inside the address tag. So the screen reader will start reading the tag and it will say address, it will start reading the address and then the address ends. That makes the difference. 
so if you see this code the address tag which has a meaningful tag name is called as semantic tag it makes a meaning to the person who is referring to the content so in short semantic tags are nothing but meaningful tag names if you put a div or address it doesn't make any difference to the developer or even to the browser but it does make a difference to the person who is referring the content or in other words it is more organized and readable code as well so this is the idea behind using the semantic tags now let's check two more semantic tags normally a section can be written using a div tag but in a web page we can use header tag for header section and footer tag for footer section of the page remember by giving header or footer tag it does not put the content on top or the bottom of the page it's just that you categorize the sections with meaningful tag names that is using the html5 semantic tags to design a page so for example i give the header tag here and inside i want to give let's say an h1 and we'll give the heading here so this becomes the header of the web page now about the footer it is used to give footers to the web page yes a web page may contain multiple footers as well so the footer looks something like this all these are included in footers you can give logo navbar links text whatever you want inside this footer tag as well so you can define footer by giving the footer tag again remember it is the css code which will arrange the footer at the bottom of the page not the footer tag only so let's give some content inside now how about we create a section so rather than giving div i will use section tag here let's add some content also the section tag is also an html semantic tag which is used to define a section inside the web page and now let's check the output you can see we have defined all of this by using semantic tags only so you can say this is pure html5 page of course there are many things missing but whatever we have used is following the semantic tag rules so the main purpose of using the semantic tag or meaningful tag names is to provide better accessibility here are few semantic tags which we will see as and when required now let's talk about a relative question so the question is what is semantic tag and why to use semantic elements in building a web page we have already seen that they are the meaningful tag names and just to increase the accessibility of the web page we use semantic tags